Welcome to Saturday Night Live at 5 with CG and Buffalo and Pastor Kwame. Welcome to another Saturday. I hope that you are enjoying the end of the week. I hope wherever you are, the weather has not been so terrible. I, you know, I didn't think we were going to get all the snow that we got, but clearly as the storm sort of grew and grew on Thursday, it <laughs> became very apparent that it was another winter storm. But welcome to Saturday Night Live, our time of devotions, prayer, and music. I hope you enjoyed the prelude music by Duke Ellington and John Coltrane. We will be featuring a lot of Black artists, artists from the African diaspora, African-American jazz artists, blues artists, reggae artists, all of those as our prelude and postlude music. A lot of it coming from my personal, um, personal collection. Um, digital collection that is because I don't have <laughs> 20 hours of music sitting in my house. No. Um, I hope this finds you well and rested and staying warm. I hope you've been able to find some downtime and just disconnection from the world. And that's not a bad thing. Not being connected all the time, having some time to yourself, just kind of being present with yourself. It's some of the, one of the better things we can do. It's been a crazy, busy week in my household as not one, not two, but three people in my household are all in different stages of higher education. My two children, undergrad students at Buffalo State and my husband, a PhD student at the University of Buffalo. So juggling schedules has been a thing this week. Um, navigating the system has been a thing this week. I've also had my own challenges ministry wise with community of good neighbors with our mobile food pantry. It's been a lot of frustration not being able to uh, actually access the physical space where we usually are at, primarily because of the weather. There's a lot of snow, there's a lot of ice. So as I said on Friday, when life gives you limes, make a key lime pie. And so I'm gonna reveal on Monday, um, part of my brainstorming. <laughs> idea um, that's going to come to fruition. And I think it's really exciting. It's just a different way to do ministry. I think we can't let ministry sort of get in the way of things that we, we are doing. So all of this month, I will actually be doing some preaching, supply preaching at Reformation Lutheran Church in Rochester. Because of the weather tomorrow, unfortunately, I'll have to do that by via Zoom. But I was there for Reverend Amani's last service as their pastor before she became our director of evangelical mission. And I'm so excited to have her as DEM. And so I was thinking about what I would share with them tomorrow. And I also have been thinking about how we invite people into our space. The gospel tomorrow is going to be talking about making fishers of men that Jesus invites those disciples to come and go along this journey with him. And in turn, we're supposed to do the same. And especially during black history month, I wonder how many times have we seen a person who looks different from a different culture come into our churches, and what is the first thing that crosses our mind? Are we welcoming? Do we see them as an asset? Do we encourage them to come back? Does this give us an opportunity to look within ourselves because we're so frantic about being fishers of people that we have to invite all the people into our space, but what do we have to offer people? In what ways are we willing to maybe let go of things of the past and allow new ways for the communal church, the big C, to become advocates and allies for those who may be walking in our doors? Perhaps it is a person of African descent and perhaps maybe your church has never had someone of African descent be a parishioner or be a part of the community. Maybe you're contemplating 
having a person of African descent of the diaspora be your deacon or your pastor in some capacity. What do we get out of that gospel when it says, come, I will make you fishers of people? I think we sometimes feel as if the people walk through our doors should walk through our doors and immediately assimilate into the way we do things instead of realizing that everyone that walks through our doors comes with a story. And instead of showing them and telling them how they're going to do things in this space, because we're protective of our sacred spaces, I think we should invite them in and sit down and hear the gospel from their vantage point. That's the only way that we will be able to gather people as community into these sacred spaces, but not for lining our pews. I think we have to get out of that. I think, and I've heard so very frantically that people are so afraid of the big C, the big church dying. They're afraid of, and I may sound like a broken record, but that's kind of what's at the forefront. And that's why I asked the question, how hospitable are you when people come through the doors? I've actually had an instance where I, I've actually had two instances where I came through the doors of a church and it was actually a part of the celebration for Bishop Vivian. I came through the doors of the church and like some of my other colleagues that were with me, we were very excited. This was a phenomenal moment. And so we came dressed as we should in our cultural attire. My face was marked with tribal markings. I don't know who my original tribe was, but I do know where my people, my ancestors have come from. And so my face was adorned in the way, in the proud way, because this was a earth shattering, defining moment. And for a lot of women clergy and laity in this church, we were all excited. And I walked through the church, but not only in that, but I had my collar on. And I also had in my hand, my robe and my stole. The woman who looked at me as I walked up to ask her directions about where the clergy would be dressing, asked me, oh, are you one of the dancers? I think we can't make assumptions about who walks through our doors and why they're there. I've also heard, heard of cases of people of African descent, African-Americans going into white Lutheran churches because that's a church up the street and because maybe perhaps they've heard good things about the Lutheran church, especially the ELCA. And they walk into the church and someone tells them, oh, you must want the Baptist church down the street. Why are we looking to fill our nets with fish that are just one type. Why do we not want diversity, inclusivity? Why are we not welcoming, just as we know Creator would welcome all, just as we know the Creator created all of us? I've walked into a church 20 minutes late because of directions. I actually was one of the people that was going to be speaking that day as a part of liturgy. The usher who was at the front door looked at me, said hello, turned his back, and never offered me anything else, leaving me to have to go and figure out where the church sanctuary was, where I could hang my coat, or anything else especially about communion, especially in these pandemic times. None of that was afforded to me because I didn't look like what this person was used to. How can we be fishers of people? How can we say that we invite everyone into our church and then when that person comes through the door, 
we suddenly become very selective and judgmental and decide that we're going to make sure that those people don't come into our churches. And this may be hard to hear, but as I said before, this is a month acknowledging, uplifting, affirming my ancestors and my people. And that means that if we're going to do this, if we're going to be people who say that we followed Christ and love, that means sometimes we have to face some hard truths in love. And so I also want to know and want you to think about it this week. If your church is welcoming, What are you doing to make sure that the community beyond your walls knows that you are an ally, an advocate, an activist, or even an abolitionist? How are you opening up your nets so that there's not only resources for your people, but you also are impacting the community beyond your walls? Gathering things just for your community is great and absolutely wonderful. But sometimes we do become selfish and we don't want anyone to have everything we, that we have. Or we become selfish and we decide we don't want to give to a particular ministry or to a particular organization, faith organization or, or sacred space because we don't particularly like who that person is or what that ministry does or Why can't they just stick to the tried and true that we've been doing for millennia? How can we expect to get anything into our nets if we don't make an effort? Tomorrow we'll share my story with the people of Reformation who are grieving very deeply because tomorrow morning they will not have Pastor Amani with them. Instead, they must begin the work of healing, of grieving, and of looking for a way that they will cast their own net out into the community beyond their four walls. How might they be a resource and an asset for the city of Rochester, for neighborhoods, connecting with people that don't look like them. How will they be welcoming? Those people who stand at your doors, the doors of the church, should be people who are extroverted, excited, warm and welcoming, willing to sit down with that new family or that new person and make sure they know everything about the service and Make sure they get connected to the pastor. The great thing about smaller churches is that we can't actually walk up to the pastor and say hello. That's something we can't do in mega churches. And I'm not faulting mega churches. I'm just saying the fact. It is very difficult to be able, unless you actually know the mega pa- the pastor of a mega church beforehand. So if we're going to be these places of hope, exuding grace, sharing our mercy, and coming together in love, then that means we need to cast wide our nets and knowing that we will be more enriched and encouraged and even empowered by what comes back to us, how we may learn from those who come in our doors, those who don't look like us or sound like us or love like us. I hope the rest of your evening is one of peace. I hope you are able to enjoy a little bit of break in this weather, especially here in Buffalo and really along the East Coast. As the weather starts to die down, we get a little bit of a break. I hope you know and remember that you are indeed loved. You are loved and beloved of the Creator.
always. This has been Saturday Night Night Live at 5 with Pastor Kwame and with CG in Buffalo. I look forward to seeing you all next Saturday. Saturday. And don't forget just some housekeeping things. My devotional Treasures of Darkness is going to be shared on Community of Good Neighbors page throughout this month. Also, our other partners and All Sacred Things Oasis community will be sharing different aspects of Black music during this Black History Month. And yes, tomorrow we will be doing our, or I shouldn't, <laughs> let me reiterate, Oasis community, of which I happen to <laughs> also um, lead. Oasis community tomorrow will definitely be doing another mini cooking sustainability episode this time. I think I won't spoil the surprise, but it has to do with oatmeal. So I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow at one o'clock right here. Well, not right here, but you'll see the link recorded video that we'll do for Oasis community and cooking sustainability. I look forward to seeing you all next Saturday. I look forward to seeing you all Wednesday afternoon for Wednesdays in the wild midweek Wednesday worship with CGN and look forward to my announcement about how we're going to do mobile food pantry in the midst of <laughs> all of the snow and ice. Have a wonderful evening, evening and God's peace.